Good evening. I'm Dave Mitchell, one of the pastors here at Calvary Church. This is our regularly scheduled Wednesday night uh, pastor study, as we call it. And uh, right now we're doing it all online so that uh, you can watch it on Wednesday night or uh, any time at your convenience. That's one of the things I love about this that allows some of this to be captured so that you can't make it on a Wednesday night the way we used to do it. Uh, you can be able to see it at a time that's more convenient for you, and we love that. So, again, Dave Mitchell from Calvary Church here in Santa Ana, and so thank you for joining in. This is a study. Uh, it's intended to dig a little bit deeper than sometimes we might go on other occasions and allow us to plow through the text, to understand the text, but also bring application. And tonight, we're in Daniel chapter 4. And just as a reminder, I guess I've been showing this just about every week, that uh, these things were written for our instruction. That's what Romans 15, 4 tells us. Uh, you've seen this verse before. You'll probably remember this verse for a long time because Paul writing in Romans, the only Bible Paul had was the Old Testament. And uh, so as he references the Old Testament, he says, for whatever was written in earlier times, earlier times would be earlier than Jesus Christ, earlier than the Apostle Paul. He was a good Pharisee, so he knew the Old Testament scriptures well. But uh, what he is telling us is they were written for our instruction. Uh, they're not just fanciful stories. They're not just things that we can gloss over. Every bit of it has a relevance to us. It's our job to discover what that relevance is for us today. So it's our instruction. Why? So that we can have perseverance. Because we may go through experiences similarly as those in the Old Testament went through them as well. And as we go through that with perseverance, we can have encouragement because the Scriptures want us to have hope. Because uh, mankind, womankind, people kind, whatever term you want to use, is constantly battling some of the same problems. And it goes all the way back to sin nature and pride. And so tonight, we're looking at the whole problem of pride of King Nebuchadnezzar. To give a little bit of a context, remember that Daniel was taken captive in about 605 B.C. He was probably, oh, around 15 years old, as you can see here on the little chart that we referenced. So you can realize that each chapter sort of moves along. But it's not like the next week and the next week and the next week is, is, a, is part of the next chapter. Uh, there's a significant period of time that sometimes takes place, and sometimes it goes back in time uh, to the life of Daniel that we'll see here in, in a few chapters from now. But notice that in Daniel chapter 4, uh, he's 50 years old. And it's really, I put out of this as well, it's kind of towards the end of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. It's about 43-year reign. Uh, and it's, re it's reaching sort of the end of that reign. That's a long time for a king to be able to withstand. Uh, often there are uh, opponents, those who would undermine the king. Uh, who can he trust? And he has full power to put to death anybody. And so that's pretty remarkable that God allowed him to rule for 43 years. God used him. Nebuchadnezzar Jeremiah tells us God used him uh, to be able to bring a form of discipline to the Jewish people. So the 605 B.C., they're taken captive, many of them all the way until King Cyrus, about 539 or so B.C., and essentially that 70 years of Sabbath that God wanted for the land that they had not given to the Lord for 490 years, and that's the reason they're in captivity in the country known as Babylon in those days. And today, if you were to travel over there, it'd be in Iran, Iraq, and there's some ruins even there of Babylon. In fact, last week we looked at the big tower that was created. There's a actually a, a brick platform that they believe that that tower might have rested on at one point. So here we are, though, advancing forward. Last week he was 20 years old. This week he's 50 years old. So about 30 years have taken place. You notice the date, 570 B.C. Uh, why is that relevant? What Daniel would have realized is that in 586 B.C., Jerusalem was utterly destroyed. He would have seen what King Nebuchadnezzar had done to devastate the city of Jerusalem, the temple of Jerusalem, taking all the gold and all the precious things that God had uh, allowed his people to create and make so that they could be part of the worship experience of Yahweh. And so here we are at a point where he's seen the devastation of uh, the continuous destruction of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, towards the end, is now about to be challenged by God. And uh, let me read through some of the text to help us to get up to speed. Hopefully you can read it on your own as well. But these first three verses are interesting because it's sort of a summary. Uh, the first three verses are actually the conclusion of the chapter. And so this is uh, Daniel writing this, telling us the conclusion that Nebuchadnezzar has reached 
because of what God did to Nebuchadnezzar's life. So here are the first three verses. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth. So that's pretty all-inclusive in terms of his power. May your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. Uh, you know, this is beginning to sound a little bit like God has softened his heart to believe in Yahweh as his Savior. And he says about God, how great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Uh, that's a pretty outspoken statement for a guy that has hated the Jewish people, hated the God of Daniel, and done everything they could to corrupt Daniel and his three friends and all the other Jewish people. But here he is coming out as if he's speaking as if a prophet, uh, speaking as a prophet who was a follower of Yahweh himself. Now what God did to create that kind of an attitude is what the rest of the chapter is all about. So we go back and we begin again. And Nebuchadnezzar has another vision. And uh, this is like 30 years since the... Uh, uh, the men in the fiery furnace had taken place, and many years after that of uh, Daniel and his prophecy of Daniel chapter 2, where he came and told the king what the dream was, and then the interpretation of the dream. So a lot of time has passed. Maybe he's forgotten about Daniel. But he goes to his, all of his uh, so-called wise men of that day. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house, flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. And so this dream that, uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time to read all of that, the dream essentially that he, he sees this big tree, it's a very powerful tree, and it's reaching out. And there's all kinds of creatures, birds that are coming in it. And he begins to realize that this is something beyond what he can understand. His wise men cannot uh, interpret it, but it says in verse 8, But finally Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belshazzar, you remember from Daniel 1, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and his uh, folks gave to Daniel and his three friends uh, Babylonian God names, not the Yahweh names that their parents had given to them. So Belshazzar, according to the name of my God. So again, he wants Daniel to convert to his Babylonian God. Daniel, on the other hand, is standing firm and wants Nebuchadnezzar to, to convert to his God, Yahweh, our God, Yahweh, if you will, in whom is a spirit of the holy gods and are related to the dream to him and Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you. And notice he's a polytheistic God, uh, uh, lover. Uh, there are many gods in, in Babylonian uh, theology, and he sees that with uh, Belshazzar as well, or Daniel. Spirit of the holy gods, plural, is in you, and no mystery baffles you. Tell me the visions of my dream, which I have seen with its interpretation. And then he goes on to describe this tree and the massiveness of it. Its heights reach to the sky. It's visible to the whole earth. Foliage was beautiful. Its fruit abundant, etc. The birds in the sky would dwell amongst its branches. Just, just vast and powerful. And this is all about Nebuchadnezzar. This is who he is. He's a very powerful man. And it says in verse 13, I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on the bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. This angelic watcher, this, this angel, if you will, came and said, and he spoke, chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip out the foliage, scatter its fruit, let the beast flee from under it and the birds from its skies. In other words, wipe it all out except for the stump and the, uh, and the ground. And uh, he's very troubled by this because he thought the tree was himself, and he's right, it is about himself. And now he's seeing this tree being utterly destroyed, and he's wondering, what's going to happen to me? So he's fearful about what this is taking place. And it says in verse 13, or, or 17, I should say, this sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers. And the decision is a command of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and it bestows it on whom he wishes, and it sets it over the lowliest of men. This is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. And uh, I love that God is getting through to King Nebuchadnezzar. And one of the beautiful things about this is that he notices that the holy ones of God, the angelic watchers, uh, they want to know that our God is the true God. You know, the world is filled with good angels, angels we call them, messengers, and it's filled with bad angels, we call them demons. 
And these angels are being reassured in this dream and with this, this discipline, if you will, this judgment of Nebuchadnezzar, that the God that they serve in holy heaven is the true God. And uh, that's why these angelic watchers are watching over this, the sentence of, by the decree of the angelic watchers. So God uses his angels and the angels are reaffirmed in their obedience to God. They love to worship him. They love to honor him. They love to serve you and me, as we're told in Hebrews. And so this is part of this bigger picture that is taking place to reassure you and me that God is in the right place. We can trust him and the angels are reaffirming that and it's being reaffirmed to them that they did not follow Lucifer out of heaven, but the angels remained holy and obedient and worshipers of God. And so this is a beautiful kind of a bigger picture that's taking place. Daniel then in verse 19 comes in, whose name is Belshazzar. And that's just interesting how Daniel continues to reaffirm, yeah, I was given that name of a Babylonian God, but he is not my God because he turns to the one true God that can give him interpretation of this. And uh, so he comes in, tells him, oh, I don't want you to... I don't want this to be true about you. He's so gracious to this man who has just destroyed Jerusalem. He is so gracious. And he says, if only this was applied to some of your adversaries, your enemies, that, this would be so much better. But this is such a devastating thing to realize about you. And he says in verse 20, the tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant and which was food for all under which the beast of the field dwelt and whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. In other words, this massive, powerful person who is over all the world and all the beasts that is in this world. It is you, O king, verse 22, for you have become great and grown strong and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion is to the end of the earth in that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven and said, chop down this tree and destroy it. And so he says, yes, this is the, the angels announcing this tree is to be destroyed. In other words, this is the angel announcing that you, Nebuchadnezzar, are going to be cut down to size. And uh, we won't take away your kingdom, we'll leave the stump but I want to let you know that your power is being taken from you. And he begins to explain why that is the case. And he goes on to describe what's going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. And it says in verse 23 again, Chop down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground. In other words, you're not losing your kingdom, but you're going to be judged because of the way you ruled over your kingdom for 43 years. He says, so chop it down, but with a band of iron and a bronze around it in the new grass of the field, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beast of the field until seven periods or seven years of time pass over it. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the most high God, Yahweh God, the God that Daniel serves, that Nebuchadnezzar has rejected up to this point which has come upon my Lord the King, that you be driven away from the mankind, your dwelling place be with the feast beast of the field, you be given grass to eat like cattle, be drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven years of time will pass over until you recognize the Most High as ruler over the realm of mankind, and he, God, bestows on those rulers whomever he wishes that kind of power. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you that you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, my advice be pleasing to you, break away from your sins. So he causes them to, to hear this truth. God reveals this truth. He says, I'm going to do this to you. And he says, I warn you that you need to break away from your sins, repent, and do what is righteous from your iniquities, showing mercy to the poor in case there might be a prolonging of your prosperity. So Daniel reinterprets the dream. You're going to be cut down to size. You're going to become this beast in the field somewhere. There's a thing called zoanthropy, uh, where people begin to take on animalistic type character traits. And uh, it is something like that, that God is going to judge Nebuchadnezzar for seven years. He's going to wander in the pasture outside of his palace as some sort of a weird beast-like animal with this crazy growth all around his body. And uh, for seven years, people are seeing their king look this horrible way. And it says, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. 
And he looks at all that and says, I have created all these great things. And then God does bring that judgment upon him. And towards the very end, he turns back to God. He recognizes who God is, and we'll see that in a moment. And uh, that's where verses 1 through 3 again summarize. This is the result of God's judgment on Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's turning from his sin, recognizing the God, Yahweh, as the most high God, the only one true God. And uh, the very last verse says this in verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven after God again restores him to his place as a king and no longer this beast in the field. Uh, For all of his works are true, his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. So this chapter is all about helping people who are proud, self-sufficient, living off their own efforts and not giving and acknowledging the need for God, the power of God, and the, the way that God can rule over them. And this applies to you and me. This applies to the President of the United States, to every king, to every dictator, to every totalitarian person that God is still in charge. And so here are some things. Romans 15, 4 says, these things are written for our instruction. So what application, what principles can come from this text? You can read through it, and I just read through it and explain what the text means, but I want to tell you how it applies to us now. And so there's an outline I've given to you. It's online. I encourage you to look at it. Here are some of the points that I bring out. In this chapter, we learn Romans 15, 4, the instruction for our perseverance and encouragement to give us hope is that he communicates the need for change. God loves to communicate the need for change, and he does that to King Nebuchadnezzar. Believers, we must show and reveal the power of God in our lives so that when the time comes that there's a need in a non-believer's life, they know that we're the person to turn to. And that's what happened with Daniel. He goes to all the other wise men. They couldn't tell him this. But he goes to Daniel because, Daniel, you're different. You've got a power that I that I don't see in everybody else. And because you have that power of God, I want to turn to you. And this is what, in verse 9, O Belshazzar, Daniel, chief of the magicians, since I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, I see in you a follower of your God, a faithful follower of your God, so I turn to you. I seek to help address this need in my life. I would love for that to always be said of each of us, of myself, that those that don't follow our God, don't follow Jesus Christ, would see within us what Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel. And this is a long time coming. He's been there for something like 35 years, and he's watched him live his life. And he says, Daniel, you've got something different. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. It's the same idea that this text teaches us that we need to present to others that we have answers that they may need. And when that need comes, some devastating experience comes, we are there to provide for them the kind of things that really give an account for what God wants to do for them. And our biggest challenge, though, in this change is pride. You probably know people in your own family, I know I do in mine, who have this proud self-sufficiency. They don't need God. And they don't need Jesus Christ. Well, notice the king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the Great that I myself have built? Sort of the self-sufficiency. I really don't need the Lord in my life. And this is the danger of pride. Notice the pride. See, three things I notice from this passage about pride. That pride is, number one, it's how I live my life. By my own strength, my own ability, my own effort. As Nebuchadnezzar says, which I myself have built. I built Babylon. And God says, no, I am giving you the privilege of doing that, but you're not acknowledging my work in your life. So pride is, number one, how I live my life. Pride is, number two, is why I live my life, the motivation, the intention behind it, my goals, my plans, my desires. He says, for the glory of my majesty, I live my life for me, for what I accrue from doing these things for myself. And we need to be careful that we don't live for anything but the glory of God. I put on the back of the outline, I don't have time to go over it, but I've talked about this before. On the back of the outline, I give you the the five P's of pride. And uh, these five P's of my position, how I value my life, prestige, how I value my life by viewing of others, power, how I have strength in my life, possessions, 
and pleasure. These are the five P's, back side of the outline. I encourage you to read through it. I give a little descriptive of each of those in ways that it's applied in our lives. It's so dangerous to live in the subtle way of pride of it's all up to me and not dependent upon it's all up to God. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar's failure was taking place. And some people think, I don't need God to be saved. I'll work hard enough, I'll, I'll do well enough, and I'll be good enough by just my own works that I can get into heaven. Uh, that's all rooted in pride. Pride is wiped away in humility, and humility is reflected in repentance where it says, I can't ever gain God's holiness in my efforts. I must depend upon Jesus Christ. And so that's where salvation is dependent upon humility, not pride of self-sufficiency and how God must be so, so marveling over how great I am. No, he, he is weeping over how much of a sinner I am, but he enjoys our repentance and humility of trusting in him for our salvation. And then pride is also grows best in prosperity. The most dangerous time is when things are going well. Uh, King David found that out as he was leisurely hanging out in his kingdom and he sees Bab Bathsheba. It's in some of the good moments of life that our pride can do the most destructive things in our hearts where I think I don't really, really need to depend on the Lord anymore. I'm, I'm kind of doing okay now. And so this is the pride that King Nebuchadnezzar had. So what God loves to do, we learn from this text in verses 19 through 33, is that he loves to confront us in our pride. He wants to humble us in the pride that I know that can be built up in our lives, especially when things are going well. So God warns us. He gives us plenty of warning. He, he wants to give us grace. He doesn't want us to experience judgment or discipline. He wants us to turn to Him willfully and will, willingly, I should say, and trust Him for His care. Notice this about this passage in Daniel 4, picking out some of these verses. Verses 24 and 25 and 27, 29. This is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you be driven away from mankind, your dwelling place be with the beast of the field. Daniel is interpreting this. This is what's going to happen to you, Nebuchadnezzar. Therefore, O King, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away from your sins. I'm giving you an opportunity to repent and turn from it. Break away is a beautiful descriptive term of repentance, of turning away from the sins of my own rebellious, proud, I built this all by myself attitude by doing righteousness. Repentance is turning from sin, the other way, turning towards righteousness. All this happened in the King Nebuchadnezzar. I, I just highlight this one phrase. It goes on in verse 29. Then 12 months later, Daniel gave this warning to Nebuchadnezzar, and for 12 months, he had an opportunity to turn away from his sin and turn, turn towards righteousness, turn toward the Most High God. It's just fascinating. This, this is really kind of a, a, a bigger picture of, of life, that God gives all of us opportunities, gives all of us time, gives all of us grace to turn from sin and turn back to God. And you probably have people in your family and friends, and like, like I do, that God is giving them extended time to turn from sin and turn towards Him. 12 months of God's grace until Nebuchadnezzar heard from God and says, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, you're not going to turn. Here you are on your, on your balcony talking about how great Babylon is because you are great and you did it all by yourself. Well, I'm going to show you uh, there's a better way to live. So what God sometimes does is he gives us grace, but then when we're not finally turning our hearts back to him in repentance, he then lowers the boom. Now, in Nebuchadnezzar's case, he doesn't kill him. He simply disciplines him for seven years. And so for a lot of us, Hebrews 12 talks about God's discipline that can come upon us because he loves us, much like a parent would discipline his or her own, his, her, her own child because we want them to do well. We want them to do the right thing. And sometimes we need motivation. And so we sometimes pray. And I, and I encourage you, I've talked about King Manasseh, who is another example of this where God brought pain and suffering to cause his heart to turn back to the Lord. In fact, I had a funeral just yesterday. And uh, one of the gentlemen, you, you can often tell when I do a funeral, uh, I can often tell who are kind of with me on the gospel and things of Christ and biblical truth and those who are not. And this particular man was sort of nodding yes as I gave the gospel and the whole idea of, of God's salvation through Jesus Christ. And afterwards he comes up to me 
He says, you know, I, I wasn't a follower. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't a believer at all. And then I was in this terrible accident. And I had this suffering, this pain that was going on in his legs and his arms. He says, I went to this church service. And in this church service, I, I was prayed over for, for physical and spiritual healing. And God healed me physically. And when I saw God doing that in my life, taking this pain from my life, I turned to him spiritually. And that caused me to convert to be a follower of Jesus. And he's been following Jesus now for years. And so sometimes God uses, and he, and he even said this, sometimes God uses these circumstances to get our attention so we turn back to him. Jesus did this many times as he healed people, as he fed people, as he calmed the storms. He gives these signs and ways that cause us to want to turn back to the Lord. And that's what God is doing in King Nebuchadnezzar's life. And sometimes I will pray for those that I know in pride are not turning back to the Lord. I'll say, Lord, you did it with King Manasseh. You did it with King Nebuchadnezzar. And maybe, maybe that's what this person needs. So that God, you would humble their hearts and they would turn back to you and see you for the true God that you are. And then restore that relationship that you desire to have with them. Whereas Nebuchadnezzar just praised you at the end, that these people would praise you in the end of their lives as well. So God's goal is full restoration. It's not to cause suffering, but it's to cause submission so that we can enjoy him and he can enjoy us once again in that wonderful fellowship. Daniel 4 says that you be driven away from mankind. Why? Until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. That's what God wants. That's why God allows sometimes these tragic things to get our attention, to get our hearts, to get our submission, get our repentance, and turn away from our pride of self-sufficiency. I can do it all by myself attitude. So God, we use that pain to change and humble our hearts. And that's what he did with King Nebuchadnezzar, where it just recognizes that immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled after the 12 months of waiting. He was driven away from mankind began eating the grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of the heavens and his hair had grown like eagles, feathers and his nails became like bird's claws. Again, I, I don't really know what that disease is, but zoanthropy is the term that I've been told is what this might have been that God gave to him or it's just some unique thing that God did for him, but it's bizarre to be sure. Uh, but uh, God knew in seven years he would need this so that he could turn back to the God that you and I would love and wanna serve. So he seeks a commitment that reflects the true change. He wants to know that we truly have changed. And so what happened with King Nebuchadnezzar, he looks to the Lord and he kneels before him in submission. This is what we want. Not, not some sort of trite little, okay, I do believe, I surrender. But a true from the heart and reflected in the body, the kneeling before God, that God, I trust in you. This, this pride is rooted out and the humility is now filled my heart. The humility of Christ when he went to the cross is what God wants to see from you and me and from friends of ours who are not believers yet. At the end of that period of time, seven years, I raised my eyes towards heaven and my reason returned to me. I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. Wouldn't you love to see that of the loved ones that we know about do, who are like Nebuchadnezzar, sort of living on their own strength and their own belief systems and, and are contrary to Jesus Christ, where they turn to God and says, you are the Most High God. And I love that phrase, I highlight it, my reason returned. It reminded me of the prodigal son. He's in the pig's pen, and he returned to his senses. It says he, he returned to his reasoning, he returned to his mind. He was out of his mind and living the sinful life in a pig's pen when he could live a righteous life in the arms of Jesus Christ. And so God wants to turn people from their sinful ways, and sometimes the Spirit of God causes reason to return to me. So I realize this is craziness. I turn back to the Lord and He redeems me. So and then I testify about God's wonderful change in my life. And I worship Him. This true change of repentance. It says in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all of His works are true and His ways are just. And He's able to humble those who walk in pride. That's the ultimate. That's what verses 1 through 3 are all about. And this is the ultimate that God wants for Nebuchadnezzar. He wants that for you. He wants it for me. And he wants it for all the loved ones that we pray for whose hearts are not humbled from their pride, that they would turn from the Lord. God uses these, these painful things to cause us to have the beauty of a relationship with Him. 
And I remember, I'm gonna close with this, this last slide, it's a little bit long, but let me read it. Chuck Colson, as you may recall, those of us who are a little bit older know Chuck Colson, and he was an outs outstanding villain during the President Nixon years. Uh, he was almost essentially a, a sort of a metaphorical hit man, if you will, until God humbled him. And this is what Chuck Colson says about his life. The great paradox of my life is that every time I walk into the prison and see the faces of men or women who have been transformed by the power of the living God, I realize that the thing God has chosen to use in my life is none of the successes. He was at the highest rank of power in the United States uh, with President Nixon. But none of those successes, achievements, degrees, and awards and honors are cases I won before the Supreme Court. That's not what God used. That's not what God used in my life, he says. What God is using in my life to touch the lives of literally thousands of other people is this fact, that I was a convict and I went to prison. That was my great defeat, the only thing in my life I didn't succeed in. God humbled Chuck Colson as he ended up being found guilty and sent to prison. And out of that became this ministry called Prison Fellowship, where he's having more impact upon people's lives than ever before in his achievement of his self-success of King Nebuchadnezzar. I did all this myself. And then when he humbled himself in prison like King Nebuchadnezzar in this pasture as a beast, Chuck Colson then turns to God in prison and is saved. And God uses that broken experience of the prison cell to impact thousands and thousands of lives. And there's many prisoners that have not gone back to prison because of prison fellowship and their ability to disciple and help lives to be changed, just like King Nebuchadnezzar, like King Manasseh, and like hopefully you and me and the friends that we want to pray for, that God would redeem them as well. Let that be an encouragement, Romans 15, 4, for perseverance and encouragement to give us hope when pride seems to overwhelm us or overwhelm those that we want to turn to the Lord, that God has his way of humbling them and that they would come to the point that King Nebuchadnezzar came to. And whether King Nebuchadnezzar is in heaven is not for me to decide, but it certainly looks like he might have had the conversion experience, but who is to say until we get to heaven and learn about that? All I know is that those that we pray for, we want them to be redeemed as well. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this beautiful chapter. Thank you that uh, Daniel recorded this at age 50 so that we could understand it today and find application for our lives as well. And Father, for loved ones and friends that we know that are maybe not as, uh, they're not a king, uh, but their pride is just like Nebuchadnezzar's. They're self-dependent. They're working their way to heaven. Uh, they don't even believe that there is a God. Whatever their case might be, that God, you would humble them and that they would come to their senses. They would the reason would return to them like King Nebuchadnezzar and they would recognize you as the most high God. There is no other true God but you and salvation is from you. So help us on that journey as we help others and pray for them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.